Hi, I'm Michael M. Middleton here, again sharing from my book, Get Real, The Pitfall of a Cultural Christianity. I will let you freeze frame the bat. Again, if this is the first one in the series you've run across to get a kind of a, a thumbnail sketch of the book. And then I will begin reading uh, three short sections to finish this book. Uh, this will be the first of them, which is an excerpt. Uh, right along the same theme from an earlier book, Sketches and Reflections, but it's an article I wrote called Bitter Fruit. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1 verse 18. This Old Testament passage is one of the clearest and most concise presentations of the gospel, the good news found in all of the Bible. I know you've blown it, messed up real bad, but simply come back to me and I will make it right. Relationship, above all else, that is what God is all about. That is the very reason he created a tiny space within himself and spoke the physical realm into existence. One simple definition of sin is the severing of relationship, turning your back on God. Every human who has ever lived has made that fatal error. The sole exception being when God himself took on human form for the purpose of restoring that relationship. Unfortunately, since the very beginning of humanity, our natural inclination when we take a wrong turn is to make things worse. We try to fix it ourselves instead of returning to the only one who can. We make a foolish choice which severs our connection to God and the light in our life goes out and we just keep messing with the switch instead of plugging back into the source. Instead of restoring what has been lost, this leads us further down the path to destruction. In order to understand this dilemma, let us begin at the beginning. Perhaps by examining the roots of this deadly deception as it operated in the earliest members of our race, we may gain the insight necessary to move more successfully to battle in our own lives. So let us now turn to the book of beginnings. Light, darkness, and a choice. Genesis begins to illuminate our journey with a concise presentation of the fundamentals of existence. After conceiving of the possibility of relationship with another, a rapturous joy which surely made must have stirred the depths of even his limitless spirit the Lord God spoke forth the seed of creation with a simple pronunciation. Let there be light. In the New Testament book of 1 John, 1 John 1 verse 5, we are told that God is light and darkness has no place in him at all. So here we see God literally giving of his own substance in the first act of creation. This is truly the wellspring of relationship, self-sacrifice. In each successive act of creation, God unfolds a continuing revelation of his nature, character, and purpose. Each day of the creation week is defined as passing from evening to morning, still the framework of a traditional Jewish day. Evening here is Erev in Hebrew, carrying the meaning of darkness, obscurity, confusion, and chaos. This is truly the state of the human heart apart from God. Mourning, then, is boker, carrying the meaning of light, revelation, understanding, discernment, and order. This is God's nature and that which he wishes to impart to us. The crown and glory of creation week is found in its final act. The glory which transcends time and space fashions a counterpart in his own image. A triune being, body, soul, and spirit, mankind now breathes the air of Eden. Contrary to the pictures you have probably seen in children's Bibles, Adam and Eve were not created naked, but literally clothed in light, as God is light. You may believe this to be simply allegorical, and yet I assure you that it is not. Beginning with Albert Einstein, a modern understanding of physics shows us that God is no liar. 
we now know some very interesting things about light. We know that light is affected by gravity. Phenomenon such as black holes and gravitational lenses display this quite clearly. We also know that light slows down over great distances. Light also exerts a force when it strikes an object, thus opening the possibility of solar sails as a means of propulsion in space travel. All of these factors would tend to indicate some kind of physical or pseudo-physical component to light. Thus it can be imagined that garments could actually be fashioned out of light by someone more intelligent and powerful than we. Whether or not this was literally the case with Adam and Eve, other more recent discoveries supporting the biblical account can actually be demonstrated today. Perhaps the covering of light upon Adam and Eve was simply a fuller expression of the light which shone from Moses' face after he had communed with God. See Exodus 34, verses 29-35. Again, one may be tempted to view the literal interpretation of this passage with skepticism, but some of the most recent advances in physics are proving the word of God true, accurate, and far advanced of any copyright date. Two Japanese physicists, I will try to get this right, Hitoshi Akamuru of Kyoto University and Masaki Kabayashi of the Tokyo Institute of Technology, oh, excuse me, Tohoku Institute of Technology, have demonstrated one of the more fascinating discoveries in the modern world of science. Simply put, the human body emits light. Mind you, I'm not just speaking of infrared energy, which we've known about for some time, but also very small amounts of visible spectrum light. Unable to definitively explain this process, they've nonetheless dubbed it as biophotonic radiation. Extremely sensitive cameras have shown levels that, though far below what the unaided eye can consciously detect, rise and fall throughout the day. As with the biblical account of Moses, the level, levels are strongest around the head and face. Perhaps, just perhaps, in a time when mankind walked more closely with God, that light from within was more evident. Sadly, our first parents, in one form or another clothed in light and life, unfortunately chose another way. The very tree of life grazed that garden in Eden, graced that garden in Eden, but God had placed another tree there as well. That tree would be the one test, the one battle that would make true relationship with the Almighty possible, for relationship simply, simply cannot be if it is not chosen. Free will is at the very heart of relationship. God wanted to be wanted. And so he allowed this one test of obedience. They were not to eat of that one tree. Mankind failed this simple test and thus fell from that place of glory. But why were they not to taste of the fruit of that one tree, beyond the fact that God had said so? Let us examine that fruit. That forbidden tree was known as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Most people skim over that without really considering its full meaning. Let's take a closer look. Knowledge here does not simply refer to an intellectual understanding, but to experiential, hands-on knowledge and application. You can read a hundred books about welding, but I'd submit to you with great confidence that you do not actually know how to weld until you've taken torch in hand and actually done it. That is what it means to know something in this sense. Precisely what does that hands-on knowledge address in this case? Most people will easily enough identify the evil component. They eat the fruit that God said not to. But that is only half of the story. But what happened next was perhaps the worst part, and perhaps the greater part of why they had to leave the garden. They tried to be what they saw as good. Realizing that the light within them had gone out and that they were now actually naked, they felt the shame, fear, and confusion, 
the bitter fruit of disobedience to God. They had unplugged themselves from the source of light and life. For the very first time, man now knew darkness. They now plunged headlong into an even greater tragic deception than that which had led them to this point. They thought that they could fix it themselves. Lost in fear and delusion, they fashioned coverings of leaves for themselves and hid from the presence of God. They stitched together a poor assembly of external things in a vain effort to replace that which had once come from within. Prideful independence, the very sin that had caused Lucifer's fall, now took up residence in human flesh. I don't need God. I can be my own God. I can do it myself. No greater lie has ever crossed the lips of man or fallen angel. Thus, although God was the one wronged, it was not his choice to break fellowship, but theirs. Though deeply grieved, God immediately took it upon himself the role of Redeemer. That which Adam and Eve had fashioned for themselves was mercifully taken away and replaced. Though only a temporary solution and an incomplete one at that, the covering of animal skins God then provided pointed forward through millennia to come towards a time that which had been lost would be fully restored, when that which was lost would be fully restored. Many scholars believe that the covering provided was from a lamb. From the tiny fraction of God that I understand, I would judge that quite plausible. After all, he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. John 1 verse 29, 1 Peter 1 17 through 20, Revelation 5 6 through 10, Revelation 13 verse 8. And so we come to the point at last. No matter what bitter fruit you have tasted, no matter what dreadfully dark paths you have wandered, the way home is always available. You must simply acknowledge one ultimate reality. You cannot do it yourself. How sadistically sad it is to buy into the lie that you have to clean yourself up enough to be good enough to come back to God. Give it up already. You cannot. You are not the source. You do not be good so that you can come to God. You come to God and He makes you good. God alone is the answer, the source, the light, the truth, the revelation. Stop messing with a broken light switch and plug back into the source. There will still be a lot of dark places to walk through in this fallen world, but with the light turned back on within you, you will find yourself back on the path towards home. Remember, grace cannot be earned. It can only be humbly received. Without the light of love it ignites, we all walk in darkness. God's hand still reaches down through that darkness to each of us, but we must of our own free will reach back up to Him. He wants to be wanted. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness but is long-suffering towards us, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. I will conclude the final essay portion next video, and then share some uh, video of uh, poems relative to it at the end on the video after that. Blessings.